Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rochelle Diamond. Thank you. Care about people more than anything. Give away credit, be completely trustworthy, and be yourself. These are just a few of the lessons espoused and embodied by the late, great Bill Campbell. Thank you all so much for coming today. So excited to have you all here. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I run our LinkedIn Speaker Series, which is all about bringing in inspiring ideas and diverse, innovative thinkers to help make our members and our employees more productive and successful. You can always catch past inspiration on our speakers.linkedin.com site. We have all the um, events recorded there, or you can download them on iTunes um, as a podcast. So I'm just so excited that you're all here today. The book, Trillion Dollar Coach, um, after, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know um, or get to experience the greatness of Bill Campbell when he was alive, but all the reading and all the learning I've done since we planned this event, I'm so grateful that Eric Schmidt, the former CEO and chairman at Google and at Alphabet, and the former senior vice president at Google, Jonathan Rosenberg, and the current executive um, communications director at Google, that they all felt so compelled to compile all this wisdom and put it in this book because it is just very inspiring. So the title, Trillion Dollar Coach. Bill Campbell was known as Coach. Um, he was a football coach at Columbia for many years before coming out to Silicon Valley. And when he did, he started at a fledgling technology company called Apple. And that's where he launched the highly anticipated product, um, the Macintosh. After that, he was the CEO at the Go Corporation and, met, and was um, the CEO at Intuit for many years after that as well. Um, after that, <laughs> Steve Jobs brought him back to Apple to be an advisor on the board. And at the same time, he was coaching um, Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page at Google. So you can definitely understand why the trillion dollar coach title makes a lot of sense. Actually makes a lot of dollars, but a lot of sense, you get it, yeah. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, our CEO, Jeff Weiner, for those of you joining on the stream who do, don't know who he is, um, he was talking about this um, event and he shared a very heartfelt and warm story that I wanted to share with all of you. So Jeff got to know Bill Campbell very well because he was on the board of Intuit for eight years with him. And he said he was one of the most incredible people that he's ever met. Jeff has met a lot of people and he would have not say that lightly. And he also said how he, you know, just made this really lasting impression on him. He told the story of the day of Bill's funeral, um, a group of people went to the old pro sports bar after. And this is a bar that Bill frequented and actually later invested in. And as I was reading you know, more about him, apparently there is a corner in the bar, and it was there when he was alive. It's a brass plaque that says Coach's Corner. And he was always there, and it was always very loud and energetic. And he would greet people not just with hugs, but bear hugs. And apparently he liked to cuss a lot. It just sounded like a very like, exuberant personality. Um, so there Jeff was with all these folks. Um, remembering Bill, and he bought a baseball cap from the old pro that day. To this day, Jeff has this hat in his office. It's the first thing that you see when you walk in because he wants to be reminded of the lessons that he learned from Bill and to make sure to carry those forward with him throughout the day. Um, so it's very near, very near and dear to his heart. So we have just an incredible opportunity today to learn more about this amazing man and we have two of the authors here with us, Jonathan Rosenberg and Eric Schmidt. And our very own Reed Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn, will be hosting the fireside chat today. So with that, let's give a warm welcome to Jonathan Rosenberg, Eric Schmidt, and Reed Hoffman. All right, let's start with a LinkedIn tradition with a slight twist. We went looking for interesting pictures of the two of you on the internet. Uh-oh. <laughs> right. On the version of what's 
Not in your this LinkedIn. This was not profile. in the briefing. No, the... yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. Read. To this, is, this is typical of you. We're supposed <laughs> to be friends. Huh. I hope we'll still be friends at the end. You know, we'll see. Um, I think we will be. So get your hand off me. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, so we'll start with these pictures and what they mean for what's not in your LinkedIn profile, uh, and then we'll do uh, a kind of a more a personal introduction, and then we'll get into the to the book and the and the whys and and the importance of it. So let's start with, I think, Jonathan's picture. Uh, I think we have that teed up, don't we? Aren't we supposed to have the picture? Yep, here we go. <laughs> so, Are you a hippie what, or what? what? What is this? <laughs> Where did you get that? Oh! <laughs> That's 1974. Um, that's the morning of my bar mitzvah. Ah. Uh, I shouldn't do math on... That's 45 years ago this summer. I remember it clearly. What I remember is that morning, I stood in front of the mirror in the house that you see there upstairs, and I was very nervous, and I was going to have to read from the Torah, and it was in Hebrew, and you know, that was hard, and I was just a kid. And I remember in my blue polka dot tie, standing in front of the mirror, thinking, I might screw up, but boy, do I look good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the rest of my family. That was fashionable. Yes, yeah. the plaid is distinctive. Yeah, and clearly uh, for Christmas, I'm going to have to get you a polka dot tie. Thanks, Reed. <laughs> right, just for you can, know. can we have? What are we going to show of Eric? <laughs> well, I believe that should be next. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not. It's you know. It's it's an action shot more than a thing. But what is what what is the look? Uh, what does this mean? This is this is me flying in New York City. Ah. And, and what did you take up flying? What, what's the um, hobby? What's the... When I was running Novell, my friend said, you're having trouble. You need something to distract you. So you should take up flying because you can't worry about your job while you're flying or you'll die. <laughs> and I had a flight instructor who, when, when I would get distracted because I had a lot going on, he would hit me. Uh, I haven't been hit in a long time. <laughs> but, well, you solved that. That's now not, not a long time. And, and what was interesting about being an executive was that flying for me um, was it. I'm, I was a sort of pleasant intellectual type, and flying is about action and taking command. And in fact, the training I'm now a, a, a as you know a jet pilot as well as a helicopter pilot. The training of taking command, working in a team, and being decisive was definitive for me becoming an executive because it helped get that sort of not nice, pleasant, thoughtful, never take all your time in the world, intellectual, academic type, and beat it out of me. So now to the other part of the personal uh, intro, so we can uh, move on from the picture. <laughs> Thank <laughs> um, you. Yes. Thank goodness. Um, and um, let's, uh, w rather than normal, like, oh, story, careers, amazing achievements, you know, la, 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 which is normally how this is done, I thought I would do something a touch more personal. Um, so what Eric actually only learned in the green room is I used to work for Jonathan. How is that possible? <laughs> so, How did you survive? Uh, with, with scars and difficulty, but you know, it, it, it came together. Um, and so... Uh, he's the same then as he is now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a challenge. Are you the same then? No, I grew up over the last 20 years, Eric. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and Reed didn't. Yes. Well, he had mentorship, you know, and coaching, right? Okay. You know, that's the thing we're going to get to. The, um, and so uh, when I worked for uh, Jonathan at eWorld, uh, and then I said I was really focused on I needed to be a product manager, I needed to have a product manager job. Jonathan was the group head of product management. And, and so I was gonna go, I, I went to this place called Fujitsu Software Corporation, which has a subsidiary here, and I called Jonathan to ask him what he thought about this. Do you remember what you said to me? Vaguely. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to go be a director at Excite at Home, and I wanted you to work for me. Uh -huh. yep. So I think I was actually a little manipulative. I said something like, Reed, if you go work for a company that isn't based in Silicon Valley, it will be the death of your career. Yep, that's exactly what you said. How did it work out for you? Well, <laughs> it worked out just fine. <laughs> uh, so that's... Um, uh, kind of how far back Jonathan and I go, we'll, we'll have our walkers at the green room. <laughs> and then uh, Eric and I have been doing, we're, be, we're best friends, we do a lot of different things together, uh, we do some vacations together, we um, also have been doing a lot of the how do you help governments think about 
the impact of technology on global society. And so we've been doing a bunch of convenings, we've been participating in convenings. And so literally, like this is like, you know, there's, there's like last week we did two, right? So literally in five days, this is, or six days, this is the third time Eric and I are doing something together. The previous ones were kind of questions about what is happening in kind of global politics and, and, and what, what is the impact of artificial intelligence and how do we make sure it's society positive and all that stuff. But Eric and I have, have multiple threads that were. It's in, the first time we really worked together was when the Congress was about to pass a law that would have favored Hollywood over, over openness. And it had a, a requirement that would essentially make it impossible to do linking without censorship. Remember this? Yes, indeed. And I was struck by how hard Reed, who was busy running you know, this company at the time, how much time you had for this, because it was such a principle. And what I, now in our, in, our, in our joint work, I figured I couldn't pull it off by myself, but between the two of us, we can really make progress on the things that matter to tech people. An awful lot of people spend an awful lot of time talking about us without understanding technology, so we're assembling the technologists to talk about us and the rest of the world. And it's a complete inversion of the model. To, and by the way, it was his idea, and I'm happy to get with it. Well, and it's technology is part of the solution. That's the short answer there. So now let's get to the book because we have you know 50-ish uh, minutes, uh, and we'll leave some room for audience Q and A. So Bill, I'll start. Um, we haven't heard a little bit from Michelle, but I, uh, from your kind of direct experience, who was Bill Campbell, and why did you call him a trillion-dollar coach? Well, I would argue that Bill was the best coach that has ever lived, the most successful. He died three years ago. And the reason is that he was the primary coach during Apple's second rise from 1993, as well as working there before, as well as the coach of Google for the last 15 years, along with a whole bunch of other companies, including Intuit and many others. Um, his value, market value generated for the companies he's coached is nearing $2 trillion. Think about it. We did, didn't mention in the earlier intro that he was responsible for the 1984 Apple ad. Well, we forgot a lot of his achievements. Uh, I'll give you an example. He was hired by John Scully, if you remember who he is, uh, in 1983, and he was hired as VP of marketing. He'd been uh, in an advertising agency, so he was clearly a talented marketing guy. But he and Steve concocted the 1984 ad, which if you haven't seen it, you should watch online using your favorite search engine or maybe your current company search engine. Either one will get you there. It's OK. OK, we're kind of liberal around Very here. Politics. Yeah, it's a, any search engine will do to get you to the 1984 ad from Apple. But it's an, an, it's, an, it's an ad that's considered iconic today. It's one of the top five most impressive ads ever made in television. Um, and at the time, what happened was Steve liked the ad, Bill liked the ad, obviously, um, and the board hated it. And they forced him to actually resell, that is, get rid of the Super Bowl 30-second 30 30 slot. Bill then figured out a way to trade another amount of money to secretly get this, the ad, and Steve ordered him to run it, and they contravening the board, and the rest is history. So he was quite, an, he was quite a, a, a successful executive before. John Doerr yesterday, was, we were talking, because he was a close friend of, of all of us, and John told me the story that when he was running Go, because John was an investor in Go, which was sort of the iPad 20 years too early. That's the way to understand Go. Uh, and he said that um, he was famous for these uh, trips to Japan for two hours and fly right back. It's a double red eye. You all know what I'm talking about from San Francisco. And um, one day he was riding his bicycle. He was some insane athlete in the mornings. And he has, he has an accident. He cracks his ribs. He goes to the hospital. He has seven cracked ribs. He goes to SFO goes to Japan for the meeting and comes back. So he had both a marketing skill as well as physical energy that is well beyond what a normal person did when he was an operating executive. I was fond of saying humbly when he would tell us stories about his career that go didn't go. <laughs> yes. And in fairness to him uh, and being honest as we can, he was a far better executive coach than he was a college football coach. He was the college football at Columbia and let's just say that Jonathan used to kid him at great length about how he never won anything. Oh, he won a few games, but he lost to Rutgers 69 to nothing and went on to a tirade forget about his team. They'd lost to a much bigger, stronger, maybe better coached team. But he used to talk about that as kind of the moment that he lost his team. And that was the last year that he coached. So uh, Jonathan, how did you first meet Bill? 
and start to work with them? Well, after you and I parted ways at Apple and you went off to Fujitsu, through, through I, went, I, I went to Excite at Home and I became a big shot, yeah. right? Because Excite at Home was successful. Hey, Jonathan, you're a little confused. Yeah? I think Reed has done really well. Oh, okay, well. We see his progeny. <laughs> yeah, you're a big shot too, okay. All right, good job, Reed. So anyway, I thought, well, in, I was a legend in my own mind. I thought I was a big shot, right? So After that picture we saw, I can see why. You, yeah, <laughs> I looked good. So uh, it was just after Eric started at, uh, at Google, and uh, he was looking for somebody to come run product management. And I was convinced that they were going to hire me, like, because I was a big shot. And you, you omitted something. Oh, they'd, they'd made me offers two times before, and I had turned them down. Big mistake. Did I have to bring him? <laughs> I think so. Okay. It's entertaining. So, so we're clear. Big mistake twice. Okay. okay. So the third time, the third I wasn't going to make a mistake. But the first time with and me. And Eric had a plan. Eric brought me in to collect, presumably to collect my offer, and he showed me the financials. The controller, Pietro Doba at the time, showed me that we just figured out price times click-through rate, and AdWords was minting money. And I was really excited about it coming to this company and accepting this offer and sort of salivating over it. And Eric was going to come back in. I was sitting at the end of a table in a big empty conference room. And Eric was going to come in and make me an offer. And I was going to negotiate, because I'm a better negotiator than he is. And Eric doesn't show up, right? Like, imagine you're me at the end of the table. Like, this guy shows up. And he comes in. Rosenberg. <laughs> I've asked around about you. I asked John Doerr. He says you're smart and you work hard. Don't give a shit. <laughs> I have one question. Are you coachable? I said, depends on the quality of the coach. And then, since I already hit Eric, he hits me. And he walks out. Smart Alex are not coachable. And he disappears into the micro kitchen. At which point your third offer My has third also offer disappeared. has disappeared okay. into the micro okay. kitchen. Super okay. fail. So I go running out into the micro kitchen. He's like fixing some tea or something. And I'm like, who was that guy? And I realize Eric said he had a coach. And he was like this old guy that coached Steve Jobs. And he was really important. And I realized that that was Bill Campbell. So I go out. Mr. Campbell, sir. Mr. Campbell, sir. I'm so sorry. Give me another chance. He's like, Rosenberg, back in the room, butt in chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, but at least sit you didn't make room. a third mistake. <laughs> I sit in the room, butt in chair, and he makes me wait. And then he comes back, and he starts delivering a lecture. And he just talks. And it's a lecture about humility. And it's a lecture about how arrogance is bad. And it's a lecture about all the attributes he looks for in leaders. And he goes on and on, and then finally comes back. Got another question. <laughs> if I were to be your coach, what would you expect to get out of it? I'm like, I was an arrogant guy. I didn't need a coach. But one thing I needed at this moment in my life was an answer. So I'd seen one of these Bud Greenspan episodes about Tom Landry, who was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And he said, a coach is someone who can see the things you don't want to see and hear the things you don't want to hear so you can be the person you always wanted to be. And he looked at me like seeing right through me. I was full of it. But he was like, all right, Rosenberg, I can coach you. <laughs> so that was. Well, it's clearly you'll, do, you'll say anything in order to get the job. So that, therefore, <laughs> yeah. you're coachable. <laughs> right? That's the lesson that I think you is that Is that one of the new LinkedIn principles <laughs> yeah, based on yeah. today's but, but seminar? <laughs> say whatever it takes to get a job, Jonathan. But the fascinating thing is, if it was a few years later that he said to me, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts, which was kind of John Wooden wisdom. And, he taught me these things by kind of breaking me down like you would break down a football player, exposing my weaknesses and my vulnerabilities, and then once I was ready to learn, teaching me how to be a leader and teaching me how to be an effective manager. So that's a good, let, let's move to the kind of the core of what Bill's uh, leadership style was, what the essence was, and uh, what, in essentially what made Bill Bill, but it's kind of like the core of the book? Like, why did you guys say, okay, this is really important? Well, let's be honest. We started writing this because we wanted to give credit to a man who had died who had enormous impact for both the Apple CEO and the Apple management team and Google 
and the other companies. But along the way, we interviewed more than 80 people, and we actually discovered that there was more than just point solutions. There was, in fact, a product here. And let me tell you what the product is. It's executive coaching of teams in business, which you never hear about. You always hear about mentors. And it's great to have a mentor. And you always talk about, hey, I want an executive coach, which is referred to a unitary thing. But in all the years that I worked with Bill, it never occurred to me because he was so focused on me and getting me to be successful that he was, in fact, coaching the whole team. So if I would get off the reservation, he would carefully create incentives to make sure that I was in alignment with what the company was doing. He did the same thing for the board. He did the same thing for Jonathan, who was a special case. The important point, the important point is that, that he would work with you, and you thought he was coaching you, but everything he did was to bring you back onto the reservation. So Alan Eagle, who's our co-author, studied a lot of this, and he said, you know, when I started this, I assumed when you started as executives, you got more and more sophisticated, more and more self-confident, more and more self-actualized, more and more capable, and more and more team-oriented as you went up in the organization, and the inverse is true. <laughs> no. That, that what happens is that the uh, what happens is that the pressures that are on the individuals at the top of these companies are so hard, especially now with the pressure, that they need coaches to keep them running at full blast. And if you sit there and you think about it, it's such an obvious idea. Why was this not common? So when I when John Doerr calls up and says you need a coach, I said no. After all, look, I'm working with these young people. I'm super accomplished. I have lots of experience. Look at all the things I know, right? I'm the experienced one. These people are super smart, and they can benefit from my wisdom, right? Typical arrogant answer. And that's the answer you get from everyone. And I think that these principles apply to every level in the corporation. And Jonathan would argue, because I've heard him say this many times, that you don't have to have a coach to be a coach. You can be a manager who learns these techniques. Which is why, and Reed, I have no idea why you did not mention this. Your core message to us was, it's okay to write a book, but you need to do a slide share. Yep, it's all and, up on slide share, by the way. And, and so <laughs> Reed said, nobody, I'm paraphrasing, nobody reads the book, but everyone reads the slide share. And I said, really? So, and he was right. So with how Google works, we followed this. We had more than 6 million views of this thing. It's had a huge impact. So again, even if you don't read the book, Use SlideShare. You have to tell them how to <laughs> find it, Eric. I think they own the domain. <laughs> you type and the trillion dollar coach SlideShare and it comes or up. Or you use your, your, your LinkedIn account to go to SlideShare.net. Oh, that's a better, yeah, that would work. They, they, they have special access <laughs> okay. here. You know, the internet thing. So the other thing I think that, that Eric left out is that he had a formula for teaching you to lead. And he used a phrase, your title makes you a manager, but your people make you a leader. And he really believed that it was your people electing you captain of the team that was the complement of the highest order that, that showed you your leadership stripes. And that to earn that, you need to be very rigorous about your management practices. And he had simple formulas for all of these things. Some of them are in the book. I'll just give you one example. You know, he had a formula for one-on-ones. And I would show up and I would have my list of five things to talk to him about and he would ask me what I wanted to talk about today and he would then compare the list to the list in his pocket and if they were the same, Jonathan had his priorities straight and if they were different, then he would explain to me what my priorities needed to be. And the attributes of the things he wanted to talk about were always the same. They were your performance on the job, but more importantly, your relationships with your peers. How are you doing with your peers? And he always wanted to talk about specifically what you were doing to innovate. And then he wanted to talk about management practices. So you, in the book, you actually go through this in some detail. Repeat the four again. Uh, performance against your objectives, relationships with your peers, your ability to innovate and drive innovation, and your management practices. And we actually learned and, something interesting. And, and, and he would do this with you every week? He would. And Really? And we learned, yeah. We actually I, I learned actually, writing. I, I actually learned this in talking to you about this because he never did that with me. <laughs> yes, we, lear we learned we learned during the book. We, we, Eric and I, Alan mediated. So the other dynamic, since you know the dynamic of writing the book, 
Alan, our co-author, would mediate the fights between Eric and Jonathan. <laughs> so when we actually talked about the section, it's called Five Words on a Whiteboard, which is how Bill did one-on-ones, I described how he did one-on-ones. And Eric was like, no, no, that is not how he did one-on-ones. I'm like, well, what did he do, Eric? And Eric said, well, you'd come in, and there'd be five words on a whiteboard right behind him. Those were the things that he wanted to talk about. I'm like, no, Eric, you compared the lists. Then finally, Alan insightfully points out, Jonathan, maybe Eric didn't need the prioritization exercise, and you did. <laughs> And also, maybe Eric said, I know there's going to be five, five words that are priorities, so I don't need to bring my own. I'll just use those, <laughs> which I might be the hack. What, to be serious for a sec, Bill actually, we talk about his extraordinary gifts as a coach and inspiring people, but he started from the basics. And that's why I wanted Jonathan to repeat the four. This is a business. You guys are serious. It's very important what you guys do. Those are the four things you guys should be talking about in every meeting and in every way. If you got that well, right, and right, then you had, then you earned the next level. Right? Well, he taught you remedial stuff, too. He taught you how to run a staff meeting. Well, Jonathan. So <laughs> here's, so, so I think his most significant contribution for me was actually a discussion that we engaged when we first started, which is how do we run this place? Now, again, the, the, the company's full of potential and all sorts of stuff. And, and at the time, this was in the early 2000s, the most popular management style was called consensus management. And Bill hated consensus, right? He just hated it. He thought it was a terrible idea. And the idea was that you would sort of somehow group rope into some common view of how to solve a problem. So what he taught and what we adopted was the following. The first thing you do is you frame a question. Like, how do we solve this problem? And then all the people who always talk then they talk. And then in the meeting, then you wait till they're done. And then the people who never talk, you make sure they talk too. And then you make sure that people who are the experts, who often are not in the room at all, are participating. And the goal is not to come to a consensus, but to come to the best idea and to do so in a timely manner. And when the best idea shows up, everyone says, oh, OK. Now, if there is a total disagreement on what the best idea and it's really unresolvable, then he would say, Eric, you have to break ties and you have to be good at it. And one day he said, by the way, you're the best executive at breaking ties I've ever seen. And I go, you know, whatever. So then the next week, it's very interesting. So the next week, I screwed something up big time. And he said, you could do much better. And then I. It took me a while, then I figured out what he had done. He had inserted an objective in my brain that I wanted to be something, because I want to be the best at breaking ties. And then when I inevitably failed, right, which everybody fails at some point, I was so frustrated in myself, I had to get better. That's coaching. Notice he didn't say, you screwed up, what an idiot, which is what a manager is tempted to say, or at least think. right? Everybody here has been through this? Come on, yes. be, be honest. Yes, you did it to me now and then. I did? Yes. And, and Jonathan did it to me, so you know, it's just a great chain it's, of it's, 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 uh, it's, it's I see, it's recursive. Yes. Um, we love using actually technically correct words yes. in the technical audience. Exactly. Uh, but, but, it, but, but in any case, the coaching technique is the same that you would use with a football player, saying you can run that past the best in the way, and then inevitably when you don't do it, they say, well, you know you can do better. Rather than saying, you idiot, I've never seen such a terrible pass throw or, or what have you. Um, it works, and it works across every domain. So one of the reasons that we want everyone to download the slide share and to purchase the books. At independent bookstores. At independent bookstores, <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Say yes, Reed. Yes. <laughs> yes, OK. See, I'm coachable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are coachable. Uh, is we want these concepts to become in, infused in everything you do, and not just in tech. Eric's good with these technical words, but you know he's not good with sort of just the layman's vernacular. And some people out here are just layman. The guy that throws the ball, he's called the quarterback. <laughs> I mean, Going back to coaching, 
there aren't teams in basketball or football that have no coach, right? So why do you guys have teams without coaches? Inside your company, there's the term of we have a team here, we have a team here, we have a team here. It's the sort of management speak that you know the business coaches built 30 years ago. It's pretty generic. Well, every, te every team should have a coach, and the coaches better be good. This is actually part of the reason why uh, I, you know, a thousand percent go, this is an important idea, because the not just coach the individuals, but coach the team is, I think, part of the upgrade practice to all management practice. I've been, I've been worried, you know, the best idea in Silicon Valley last year was your book, Blitzscaling. And you know this because I've complained to you that you were two years late, yes. right? Chip. <laughs> So, so, so your idea was last year's best idea. So you've now made it feel like my idea is the best idea this year. Okay, so we're on a roll. So I don't know what you're gonna do next year, but we need to compete on this. Um, but, but every once in a while, these ideas come out and they're powerful in the same sense that the blitzscaling notion really is a powerful notion of how to organize scale. So the earlier you gestured at that Eric learned how to run a staff meeting. Should we come back to that? Sure, he missed his cue. Yes. <laughs> so Bill actually taught us that we should start staff meetings with trip reports. Eric did this, he came into my staff meeting and told us to do this as well. And trip reports were really just this mechanism to start the meeting off. We used to use Google Maps and we would all sort of share where we'd been and we'd share some observations about you know, broadband connectivity and what search engines people were using. And it was a way to start the meeting where people show up and they're all sort of like, you know, girding for battle, right? All the sort of type A personalities. I want to work on this problem right now and so forth and so on without any regard to the humanity and the experiences of the people around. And the dynamic of starting with trip reports really changes things because you're talking about what you did, you're having some sort of shared moment and shared experience. And then inevitably when you get to something where there's a lot of conflict, you've at least started the meeting by establishing a rapport. And Bill did this, people would come in and they would think, as people would get introduced to Eric's staff meeting, they would think, well, I think like really important things go on there. They spend three hours like coming up with action items for the rest of us. And we'd show up and we'd start talking about, oh, I was up at Hill Park and you know, I went to the San Diego Zoo with my kids. But it actually fundamentally changed the dynamic on the team. Total sense. Um, by the way, in about five to 10 minutes, we're gonna do questions. There's a microphone there, you should line up for it. Um, but I just give you a chance to think about it. So, um, what would you say was the most interesting parallels or the learnings from the football coach to business? Because I think one of the things that people find surprising is like, it's like, oh yes, of course we should have, we should have performance as a team, it shouldn't just be individuals. The team sport is what wins. And so I have coaches, but like you think football, is that? Oh, but, but, but come on, isn't football full of people who are young, have outsized opinions about themselves, prima donnas with exceptional skills? Am I just defining Silicon <laughs> Valley or what? So aside from the fact that the product domain is quite different, obviously, I think it's the same human principles. Another thing he understood was, Reed, you're doing a great job of moderating us. <laughs> he would just burst out real time in meetings clapping. Okay, and no, no, let, let's, let's show this, oh, okay. okay? Okay, come on. What do we think of this audience? This is a fantastic audience, <laughs> okay? And what about the book authors oh, <laughs> and the book? Oh, okay. okay. Now, now, did you notice what happened? Uh -huh. Energy, yep. Energy went up, everybody's engagement, everybody's smiling. Now, I can't imagine that you have long, boring meetings at LinkedIn. It's not possible. It's such a dynamic culture. But if there is ever a long, boring meeting, one of you needs to erupt in percussive clapping. <laughs> the, the great thing that Clay told us, Clay Bavor was running uh, our, was running our virtual reality uh, team. And you know, he was nervous. He was in the Google board meeting and he hadn't presented there before. And it was unclear whether or not they were gonna like his idea. And, you know, about a third of the way through, suddenly, as he's presenting, and nobody can argue with that, right? <laughs> it's just like, 
a way of supporting what are you, someone. Stop that, clapping. Right. I mean, what are you going to say? What are you going to stop do? that? Stop like that. That's well, terrible. I, right? I mean, not say, well, I don't like this product after somebody <laughs> does that. Right. So it's it's just, you know, an amazing dynamic. But also it's the same thing you do in football. And one of the things that he really was terrific at is he would give you negative feedback real time, but not real time in the meeting. Real time right after the meeting. And one of the other characteristics was his direct honesty, often full of profanity. Um, so if you screwed up, you would hear directly from him in private, and you knew it mattered. So again, don't think this was just fun and motivation and percussive clapping. There were both sides of this. Bill, because um, I also knew him lightly, not as well as either of you or Jeff. Well, um, how did he make you feel? Well, I actually never had a one-on-one -on -one with him. I, I, I met with him with, uh, sometimes with other folks who, where someone said, hey, I'd like you to show up at this meeting with Bill. And, and so I had a light interaction with him, but not, uh, uh, not in depth, which made reading the book really uh, kind of a lens into the, why this was, Bill was such a towering figure, a colossus in Silicon Valley. And so, um, but one of the things that I picked up from my very light interactions is Bill was one of the earliest people to start saying, we should fix diversity here in the Valley. Say a little bit about that. So we interviewed, many, so we interviewed lots of people for the book. Uh, Shelley Archambault, who was a CEO um, who he coached, told us not only about him reaching out to help her, but he ran a meeting with her and a group of maybe 10 or 12 women who, would, who were CEOs. And each quarter, he'd have some different thing to focus on with them. And he was terrific about pushing for more diversity on boards. He would remind them of things like, anytime you need a board member, look at the people around this room. Uh, you know, he would remind product managers, 51% of your target market is women. And also he would say that you, know, you can get a diverse and inclusive workforce. It may take slightly more time, but the benefits are enormous. And I know you all know that, but he was one of the first people to do it. And I think it's true everywhere. So uh, uh, last question for me, we've gotten through less than a third of the questions I wrote out, not surprising, and then I will flip over. But the last question is, one of the other things that I was always puzzled about was that Bill worked with difficult personalities. You know, Eric, um, uh, sorry, I had to, you know, add that in. But you know, uh, Steve Jobs, right? You know, other folks who are notoriously like, my way, the highway, the asteroid is going in this direction. How did Bill do that? How, how could the rest of us learn from that? My observation about him was that his strategy with each person was very person dependent. So with Steve, he had worked with Steve on the marketing side. And then when Steve returned to Apple, Steve put him as his first board member. So he put him in as one of his bosses, if you will. And I think that he was in there to sort of keep, Steve, when I talked to him, had sort of grown up over the years. And I think Steve put him in there to sort of help him with his rough edges. So when Steve would start screaming, right, uh, over something, Bill would talk to him afterwards in private and, and sort of coach him off the, le the ledge, if you will, or say, maybe you were too rough with him or her and that kind of thing. But it was always, it was always individual. Um, he, when, when Larry replaced me as CEO after my decade of being CEO, Larry met with Bill every week the same way I did for an hour to go through in great detail what was Larry trying to achieve, what were his principles, how could he get there, and, build, and again, it was a different conversation. So at the CEO level, the CEO, especially in the Valley, the, the CEO personalities are so different, right? So in terms of personality, some are you know, sort of insanely aggressive, some are relatively quiet, all are super smart, but he was very good at managing anyone who's like that. We talk in the book about managing aberrant geniuses, and technology is the kind of industry where you have to have superstars, and you have to help them succeed. You have to remind them that it's not just them who's powering the world, that there's about 100 people who are working with them, who are working under their direction, who need their help, and who are assisting. And you know, the standard comment I have is, who created the iPhone? Steve Jobs. Okay, now think about that. How many people were involved in creating iPhone version one? More than Steve Jobs, trust me, like about 1,000 people, plus all the yeah. semiconductor industry and so forth and so on. Let's give credit where credit is due. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's also very nuanced. He would put up with different things and treat different people differently. So, for example, I once acted like Steve Jobs. There, I, I would yell. And there was an article in Gawker about the imperious chair-throwing tech executives who would yell. And it was a ranking list. And Steve Jobs was number one, and Steve Ballmer was number two, and Mark Benioff was number three, and Dave Colburn was number four, and Jonathan Rosenberg was number nine. <laughs> and like, I was really proud of myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and so we're clear, this is actually true. Yeah. Right? He actually went to his staff meeting and talked about it and took praise from his staff for so, being one of the terrible tyrants so of tech. I, I went to Bill's <laughs> office the next week, and usually he was like right there in his conference room ready to go over his list. And the conference room is empty, and the article is on the table. And he leaves me there for a little while. And then he comes in after I've been wondering, you know, why it was sitting there. And I'm, Bill, I'm so pleased you read my article. And he's like, Rosenberg, I worked with Steve Jobs. I know Steve Jobs. You're not Steve Jobs. <laughs> you don't get to behave this way. And he threw me out of his office. And what happened to your? Well, he actually, he actually called Shona Brown, who ran HR, saying, I just took Jonathan to the woodshed, and I'm a little worried about him. <laughs> Check on him. <laughs> Two weeks later, I went back you know, again to grovel. And I'm ready to apologize and tell him everything I've learned. He opens the door. I'm ready to apologize. And he just hugs me. I'm like, Bill, here are the things I learned. Bill, I'm sorry. Here are these things. Jonathan, I don't need to hear what you learned. I took you to the woodshed. I administered the lesson. I know what you learned. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And with that, uh, say your name and then ask a question. Hi, uh, my name is Krishna. I worked at LinkedIn in 2008. Um, wisdom was never this funny. Uh, thank you for this. My question is, um, I'm also a coach um, at a different level. Um, I work with product management and engineering. Uh, do you have any wisdom for how to better collaborate product management and engineering leadership for the ultimate goals of the organization? Uh, many companies have a imbalance and a dysfunction. So can you talk about that? So, well, first of all, I'd hire, if, I think product managers should be technical. Um, and product managers, Bill would say, shouldn't tell engineers what to do. In fact, he would get very upset when product managers would tell engineers what to do. Uh, some folks at Intuit told stories of him telling product managers he'd throw them out of the room when, he'd, when they'd dictate to the engineering folks what to do. I think he wanted product managers to educate engineers on what the problems were and to sit with the engineers and work with them on a daily basis as they iterated and to set very, very aggressive goals, but not do it from the standpoint of very rigorous plans, but rather to define the goal that they were trying to achieve and then periodically sit down and have discussions around features, resources, and schedule and try to make the trade-offs so that you could deliver the best product functionality as expeditiously as possible. Bill was a big fan of doing things quickly. Bill believed that the markets moved very, very fast and you needed to get to the market with something that addressed the problem that you'd articulated that you wanted to solve as quickly as you could. Can you describe the APM program, something that you and Marissa did? Yeah. Um, so I'd actually, uh, I'd actually been at Google for uh, about eight, nine months trying to hire people. And you know, Bill was a big proponent of building a team. He would always say, you can't do anything without a team. And so I was out trying to hire people and generally thought, well, great product managers are people like me who went to business school and graduated with degrees in economics. And Larry didn't like any of them. And thankfully, uh, Marissa came up with the idea, Marissa Meyer, who was later the CEO at Yahoo, of hiring what she called APMs, which were associate product managers. And her thought, which initially offended me, was she said, well, Jonathan, business is easy, but teaching you computer science is hard. <laughs> so we should just go get people who actually studied computer science in school, and we'll get them right out of school, and then you can teach them business. And that's actually what she then did. And Larry liked all of the people who we started to hire straight out of school. And most of them, one of them I mentioned, Clay Bavor, is now a VP at Google. Brian Rakowski is a VP at Google. Avni Shah is a VP at Google. 
most of the senior leaders in product management evolved out of that program over the last decade. By the way, uh, we covered that on Master the Scale of the Marissa episode, the Google APM program, and part of how she uh, recounted that meeting with you is you wouldn't give her any headcount because they weren't revenue generating, right? And so she had to, to kind of figure out how do you, to persuade you to give her headcount. Well, she persuaded Bill yes. to join her side, <laughs> and Bill helped her, yes. and I listened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hello. I have some questions um, that have come in from the stream from employees who aren't in the room. Um, so one of them is, who are coaches like Bill that are helping young new leaders out now? And how do we create greater investment to coach diverse young new leaders? Uh, who are uh, coaches that are helping great young leaders now and young teams? Because obviously part of the whole thing that's magical with Bill is not just individual coaching, but team coaching. And what does that challenge and effort look like now, if there's anything that you would well, I would argue Jonathan is, in fact, doing this function. So maybe, Jonathan. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're actually uh, good at this. Thank you. Thank, I'm thank not. you. Um, <laughs> so, well, I'm, sure I, I'm doing some of it. There's, uh, but I, I, think, I think that sort of misses, I think, the most important message that I think that we hope people get out of the book. Um, I think that all managers can elevate themselves to be reasonable coaches. And that's really why we tried to, we call the book a playbook. And we've tried to codify and articulate the principles in a way that anyone can do these things. And what's interesting is these things sound easy, but you really have to take the time to stop and do them. You know, you can't, some managers are trainable. We train, thank you, there we go. <laughs> you know, Eric could be trained to stop and make people smile each time they left his office. <laughs> and ask them a few questions about their family and, and their lives. Get back to work. Then. And get back to work. <laughs> so some of these principles are very simple, but, but yet they're difficult, right? You can sit in counseling and, and learn about empathy and define it, but it's hard to do. And by the way, a comment about humans is that when people are under pressure, they tend to revert to, to their core behavior. So if you're sort of controlling and tense and driven, all these empathetic, all that empathetic crap, you're going to forget all of that. So it, the book is easy when you're not under pressure, but it's hard to remember. One day, I was upset about a whole bunch of stuff, so we have a staff meeting. I started this and this and this and this, because Bill had said, say what you think and be your authentic self. And by the way, I was. I was upset. <laughs> and so after the meeting, he says, you did half of it right, and you failed the other half. Right? You didn't get the, you didn't, you know, catch the ball, right? You got everybody directly, but you didn't allow for the time for them to process it and for them to see that you understood the challenges that you were giving them, right? It was actually an error. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Ali from Ads AI team. Thank you for a very uh, inspiring uh, uh, talk. I really liked it. So I have one question. Uh, you talked about coaches. Uh, how do you define a go good coach, and the other side is uh, the people that receive the coaching, they should have some kind of techniques to learn from the coaches. What are those techniques? So, so the question is, how do you find uh, good coaches, and then how, what are the key lessons in terms of learning from them? Obviously, some of the stuff we're covering. Um, I will say, by the way, use LinkedIn, uh, you know, search for coach, but yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so our, we have a hidden agenda for being here, which is we would like LinkedIn to have a major executive coach for business program. We hope that you will see that this is a great opportunity to strengthen what you do, which is hugely important. Think about virtually all of the interesting hiring now goes through LinkedIn. Why does the interesting coaching not also go through LinkedIn? At the scale, I can imagine lots of things, products to invent for you, uh, things like uh, awards and contests and um, various forms of rankings and ratings and so forth, right? It would work. Right? And you probably make a fair amount of money doing it too. So there's, a, there's our contribution to you guys today. Um, people are in constant search for this, and it's, there's no list right now. There's no place to find it. In my case, uh, there was a gentleman, who, Bill Campbell, who had, knew his friend John, who called me. But that's a rare event. Right? So I think we need to systematize this. LinkedIn has systematized. We talked a lot about how you've systematized human contact, human processes. Why don't you guys solve this problem? That was a really good answer, Eric. I used to be really good at this stuff. <laughs>
But remember, re remember, if you're a CEO, revenue solves all known problems. <laughs> and so your CEO is going to look for any revenue ideas out of this hour meeting. So we have some more. Um, you both knew him well, but what surprised you most when researching this book? What surprised me most was that he was a coach of teams because I really thought of him as a coach of me as an individual. And we really initially set out to write the book by going and speaking to all of these people and just understanding the specific management practices, the things that I think we already understood, how he did one-on-ones and how he paired people together. But I kept hearing the same stories from people about what he would say to one person about another person, or examples like the example I gave where he went to Shona and said, I'm worried about Jonathan, I just took him to the woodshed. And what I think was so fascinating was that none of us were aware of that. You know, I'll tell you one other quick story where I saw that Patrick Pichette, who is our CFO, joined uh, sometime after we went public. And at Google, I don't know if LinkedIn is like this, but we sort of have this way of like hazing new employees and you know the donor tissue rejecting the DNA when we bring in somebody senior. And Bill said to me right when Patrick started, you know, you should have lunch with him every Friday. Oh, okay, Bill. And he went, we then learned that he had said to Patrick, Jonathan's really busy, but if he were willing to make time for you to have lunch on Fridays, that would be a great signal that the management team was really accepting you. <laughs> <laughs> and notice, I, notice the coach working both sides of the equation. So, so for me, the thing that I was struck by was sheer, I'm very interested in scalability as a computer scientist. And how do you scale human systems? So when Bill would go to the Super Bowl with his friends, he would rent a bus. When he would take the middle school kids he was coaching on the soccer field, he would rent a bus. He was constantly surrounded by communities of his friends who were disorganized in a, around love and friendship, right? Not in any formal way. Each of you can behave the same way, right? You can have that kind of impact in your home life, your religious life, your educational life, your work life, your, uh, uh, you know, whatever hobbies you have and so forth, but do it at scale. So when we finally showed up at his funeral, the vastness of the, of the, of the empire was really what struck me. Actually, this, I think this is a good opportunity to go into another of the questions we didn't get to, which is when Google was going public, Bill advised you to stay as CEO but step down as chairman. What was the dynamic there? Well, what happened was the, the company had decided to adopt dual class, which at the time was very controversial, maybe still be controversial for other companies. And in the politics of the, the board and the transaction with the lawyers, it was agreed that it was better to have an external, uh, external chairman. And so I was informed of this. And this really hurt my feelings. One is because I was, in my opinion, doing a great job. And OK, sure. Things were going well. I was about to take the company public. And frankly, my career path was to become that chairman. I didn't want somebody in my way. So I told Bill I would, be, I would just quit. I mean, after all, I was three quarters vested. I had plenty of options. There were plenty of good choices in the Valley at the time. This was 2004. We had recovered. Of course, this would have been the stupidest thing I had ever done in my entire life, bar none. So what was interesting was Bill listened to this. He said, OK, I'm going to come by and visit you tomorrow, which gave him time me to calm down, a time for him to formulate a plan. So he shows up, and I complain to him, and I say all this, I'm good at this, and so forth, this is being done to me, it's really hurt me, it's hurt my feelings, my pride is hurt, okay? And you're not gonna say this to anybody other than your mentor or coach, you're not gonna say this to anybody else. There's no board member I would say this to, but I'd say it to Bill. And Bill looked at me and said, I can fix this, I will fix it for you. And that's all he had to say for me to back down and continue. And indeed, I was, became non-chairman. And then about a year later, I became chairman again. The interesting thing about that was that my trust in him was so great, he didn't have to explain how he was gonna fix it. And as best I can tell, he probably didn't know, right? <laughs> but he knew at that moment that a team member right, of the, the team, and an important one, the person who's gonna take the company public, is about to quit, right? So he's gonna do whatever it takes to keep the team together. 
this, of course, is part of the reason I wanted to get back to this question. It's part of the reason why, um, you know, a trillion dollar coach is the results of that are hugely important. Hi, thank you. My name's Robert. This is a question kind of about Silicon Valley broadly and in general, but also the seemingly very dense connections between founders of each new wave of companies. So when we think about Bill Campbell, who seems to have touched so many great leaders in Silicon Valley, and then uh, maybe the story out of PayPal is a similar example of this. Do you have any reflections on why in each wave of companies that come out, it seems like it's a group of 15 people at the top, or at least reading the histories, it can give that impression. Network densities in Silicon Valley. Okay, Kevin, and, and well, in fact, you've written about this at some length, Reed, so, uh, and his, his blogs on this stuff are incredible. I hope you use LinkedIn to popularize these. Okay, good. Shocked, just, shocked. Just reminding <laughs> yes. you. Um, the, the industry started, when I started as a computer science, computer science didn't exist. And when I worked at Xerox Park, there were probably 100 people working on it, and Xerox had an unusual, a large collection of such people. When I worked at Bell Labs, the other 10 out of 100 were there. So we have all benefited as in, in our generation of watching it grow up. So it's not clear to me that the same opportunity is before the next Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs, right? But they exist, but they exist in a larger ecosystem. So having said that, I think it's true that in high pressure, fast growing systems, there's enormous shared learning, and that enormous shared learning has huge network value. An example that I would use um, is the ad system that Google built, which we built very early, which Jonathan basically, Jonathan and Salar and Susan did, um, in 2003, 2004, the people who then left to go to Facebook were trained by us, right? And these APMs, who at the time were 22 and are now in their mid to late 30s, are running the tech startups. They all went through this program at a younger age. So it's probably true that the network is such that independent of the total size of the network, these groups form, and maybe they're 15, 20, I think you're roughly right, and they have this crucible moment where an enormous amount of learning happens, and then they go off. You can imagine that in two-sided markets, um, the collection of people who've done Airbnb and, and Uber and actually kind of figured out how they worked, that might be a next generation of such thing. Head of product management for many years came out of Google and had worked on ads, Deep and Sharp. Exactly. Right. Was there another? I'm still sore about that one. <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize we were, we were counter-selling on that one. But yeah, Deep is very good. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Listening to the stories and kind of your coaching journeys has been fascinating. So I'm an HR practitioner here at LinkedIn. Seriously believe in the coaching journey for all of the leaders in this room today. So I guess my question is, one of the things we try to inculcate in this experience is as a leader, you're emerging and formulating thoughts, right? So you're interacting with Bill who's being prescriptive sometimes, building trust sometimes. Can you talk to us about either of you where he shared some advice with you or was guiding you and you were a hard no and, and felt like your leadership instinct kicking in and saying thanks but no thanks? Um, so for me, it was always through narrative. He would just tell a story. Uh, you know, if I'd, if I'd been too aggressive with the team, he'd tell that Columbia, you know, lost 69 to nothing story. And people would often wonder when they would meet with him like, why is this guy telling me these stories? But at, over time, you, you learn to think about what the story that he told you was, and then there would always be a message to the story. Um, you know, so, so mostly it was through narrative. Um, one of the things I'd be happy to do, we're actually, uh, it's, it's good that we had an HR person come ask, ask a question. Uh, we're actually now using the book and the principles that we heard from people to update the Google internal management training classes. And I'm happy to talk to other HR leaders and other companies and share some of the structure and principles that and, we're trying to build. And I bet that your HR training here is not coaching, is, is not, does not start as a base of coaching. It starts with other values. And we're arguing that every corporation, starting with this one, right, 
modify it to include these principles and teach people how to do this. And you'll empower the next generation of great coaches. By the way, we have some, but you can always learn, which is the kind of key thing. And so, unfortunately, our authors have to run off. They have another thing. Um, but let's give them a great thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Reed. Thank you, Reed.